Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this session. Um, I see the people still signing up. We'll wait about two minutes and then we'll carry on. Hello everybody, I'm still here. I'm just waiting for people to sign in. Fine. Good morning. I'm Wendy Peplet, Chief Education Specialist Languages. I will be your presenter today. Before we begin this webinar, let's cover some of the basics. If you are struggling to hear me, make sure your audio is on and your speaker volume is turned up. This is very important. We get um, messages to the organizer that they cannot hear. The problem is on on your side, not on our side. You will automatically be muted when joining the session. Should you have any questions, you can ask your question in the question box below or on your right or raise your hand. To raise your hand, click the icon on your dashboard below or on your right. Download this presentation um, in the handout box below on your right. I just want to, to draw your attention at this moment. The complete presentation is available to you to download. Um, so if you think I'm going too fast, remember you have got access to this afterwards. So I urge you to listen attentively and to leave your note making to after the session when you have the presentation. You will also find all this information in the question box below or on your right. Remember to send us your questions. Attendees are encouraged to ask questions and leave comments. However, irrelevant or inappropriate comments will result in the attendee being dismissed from the session. If you did not get your question, please send an email to academics at Questions in the question box will be answered and made available afterwards. If you did not receive the questions and answers, please send an email to info at impact.co.za. Visit the IMPAC YouTube channel for recordings of the session. I'm now going to explain the June examinations to you. At this point, we don't know whether they are still going to take place or not, but they will be the same more or less for November examinations as well. Your paper one consists of section A, which is a comprehension of 30 marks. Section B is a summary for 10 marks. Note, home language learners have to write their summary in paragraph four. Section C, language in context, 30 marks. This will include visual literacy, for example, an advertisement, a comic strip, a book cover, a poster for a film, anything like that. Paper two, section A is your poetry section. You will receive four questions, question one to four, they are your prescribed poems that you have to study. You have to answer two, that will count 20 marks. Question five is an unseen poem for 10 marks. That 
is compulsory, you have to answer question five. Section B for um, June examination is your drama Othello, because you have only studied the drama. Question six will be contextual questions for 25 marks. Question seven will be a literary essay for 25 marks. Paper three, section A is your essay for 50 marks. And section B, you need to write two transactional texts, two by 25 marks. Let's look what you have to study specifically for paper two. Your poems, Journey of Magi, A Piece of Earth, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, London, The Lonely Betters, and Notes on Answering an Unseen Poem. You have to study drama Othello, the entire play. Remember, you are going to write about this play again in the November examinations. So if you are preparing or have prepared for the June exams, this is not wasted as all this will be included in your November exam as well. And it would be part of your um, test paper, which was supposed to or is supposed to be written in uh, May. Now I am going to start with term three literature. The reason being you would have been writing June exams now. If they decide to move the June exams to a later date, you are going to run short of time for your term three work. So this week we will be studying week one work as in your year plan. The poem we are going to look at is My Last Duchess. It is quite a long poem. And your novel, The Fault in Your Stars. You must start reading this, this novel. It is always advisable to read the entire novel before looking at the study notes. But if you have not done that, at least look at your introduction and ch chapter one this week. My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. Ferreira. Ferreira is the narrator of this poem. My Last Duchess is narrated by the Duke of Ferreira to an envoy of another nobleman, whose daughter the Duke is soon to marry. The poem represents a dramatic monologue in which the Duke addresses the messenger sent by a count whose daughter he wishes to marry. The messenger is there to negotiate the terms of the marriage settlement, and the duke leads him on a tour of his treasures. They stop at the curtain of picture of the late duchess, which has been painted directly on the wall. Let's read the poem. That's my last duchess, painted on the wall. Looking as if she were alive, I call. That piece, a wonder now, Fra Pandol's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will't please you sit and look at her? I said. Fra Pandolf, by design, for never read. Strangers like you, that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. And seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there, so not the first. Are you to turn and ask thus, sir, t'was not? Her husband's presence only called that spot. Of joy in the Duchess's cheek, perhaps. Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle lapse. Over my lady's wrist too much, or paint, must never hope to reproduce the faint. 
half flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. So it was all one, my favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bow of, che of cherries, some officious fool, broke in the orchard for her, the white mule. She rode with round the terrace, all and each, would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked, somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked. My gift of a 900 years old name, with anybody's gift, who'd stoop to blame the sort of trifling, even had you skill in speech which I have not to make your will. Quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in your, you disgust me, here you miss. Or there exceed the mark, and if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands, then all my smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Wilt please you rise? We'll meet. The company below, then I repeat. The count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no, no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed. At starting is my object, nay, we'll go. Together down, sir, notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which class of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Now, if we look at, we won't say stanzas as it is one long stanza, at um, a few lines at a time. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive, I call. Wall and call rhyme. That piece a wonder now, Fra Pandolf's hands. Worked busily a day, and there she stands. Hands and stands rhyme. Note the iambic pentameter. Lines are rhyming couplets. Every two lines rhyme, they are rhyming couplets. Um, an iambic pentameter means that um, it's a beat of five repetitions. One short, one long, one short, one long syllable. Or we could say one unstressed, one stressed, one unstressed, one stressed syllable. But the enjambment is so clever that you do not notice the rhymes. If I read the first or from the second line, I call that piece a wonder. Fra Pandol's hands worked busily a day. You almost do not notice the rhyming couplets. The run on line support the conversational tone. This whole poem is written as a monologue. We said at the beginning, a dramatic monologue. So it is speaking, it's a conversation taking place. My last, Duchess, emphasis on my last. The former Duchess, 
remember the messenger is bringing um, a message from who would possibly be the new duchess and he is now speaking of his former duchess one in a list this suggests a string of wives note the possessive my my last duchess fra meaning brother or friar pandolf the friar who painted the portrait he would not have had amorous inclinations he worked busily a day the friar put in a lot of effort to achieve the likeness of the duchess the duke admires the artwork not the person Wilt please you sit and look at her, I said. Fra Pandolf, by design, for never read, said and read rhyme. Strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, countenance and glance. Wilt please you sit and look at her? This request sounds like an order to the messenger to sit and look at the portrait. The messenger does so, and he becomes increasingly cowed. Fra Pandolf by design. The Duke deliberately mentions the painter, because everyone who sees the painting wants to know how he conveyed her expressive eyes and passionate nature. But to myself they turned, sin since none puts by. The curtain I have drawn for you, but I. And seemed as they would ask me if they durst. How such a glance came there, so not the first. Are you to turn and ask thus, sir, it was not? Her husband's present only called that spot of joy in the duchess's cheek fra pandolf chance to say her mantle laps since none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you but i you can see here or you can picture here that the painting is on the wall and the curtain is drawn over it so it is not revealed to everybody passing by the Duke is the only one who unveils the portrait. Only he can look at it. And at this moment, he has shown it to the messenger as well. If thy durst, people don't dare ask, but the Duke assumes they want to know why she is blushing. If we look at Spot of Joy. It was not her husband's presence only called that spot. Here we pick up a tone of suspicious jealousy. She was not blushing because of her husband's presence. The Duke is angered by this. Frau Pandolf chance to say her mantle laps. You'll see that's a repetition of the previous um, piece that I did. I have not highlighted the lapse because it's not going to rhyme with the next words here. But I've repeated it here because we are going to discuss it a little bit further. Over my lady's wrist too much. Her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Or paint. Must never hope to reproduce the faint. Half flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much and paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat the artist wanted to reveal more of her loveliness her beauty is highlighted her delicate coloring the artist flattered the duchess with his patter the patter of the paint, causing her to blush. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought. She didn't think it was wrong to be flattered by somebody else. 
she thought he was just being courteous. Duke thinks Pandolf's compliments should not cause her to blush, as if she could help it. For calling up that spot of joy, she had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad. Too easily impressed, she liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. She was, according to the Duke, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. The Duke reminisces about his wife. He is hypercritical about her. She was natural and spontaneous, not sufficiently aware of how important her husband was, or sufficiently proud of his rank. So it was all one my favor at her breast the dropping of the daylight in the west the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her the white mule she rode with round the terrace all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech in other words, she did not differentiate between who was paying her compliments, who gave her the gifts. Or blush at least, she thanked men good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked. The Duke reminisces about his wife. In other words, he is thinking back about his wife. And he is hypercritical about her. She was natural and spontaneous not sufficiently aware of how important her husband was or even sufficiently proud of his rank she was undiscriminating in her approval of everything a beautiful sunset or some cherries picked for her by a young man or a little pony she rode just look at the list she did not realize that her husband's gift was the only one she should have acknowledged. That is according to him. Here again, you can see his um, jealousy about her and not wanting to even share the small, natural, normal things with somebody else. Nature, sunset, cherries. Things without tangible value reveal her appreciation of nature. Kindness. She valued a thoughtful act. Warmth. Love of animals. Here you can pick up a bit of her warmth, her character, her character of what type of person she is. my gift of a 900 years old name can you see how important he thinks he thinks he is my gift of a 900 years old name and she should have valued this he thinks with anybody's gift in other words how can she compare this gift of 900 years old name with anybody else's gift the cherries etc that we picked for her Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not to make your will. Quite clear to such an one. Um, here you will again see I've taken a line from the next one. I have not colored in or highlighted the rhyming word as it will be on the next page. My gift of a 900 years old name. With anybody's gift, this is a sinister version of taught. His harsh cruelty coming through. Um, he can't think that any gift could be worth more than his name. 
he would not have accepted any apologies, excuses from her anyway. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? This is a rhetorical question. He assumes it is obvious. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Anyone would agree with him, he thinks, or he assumes. He did not tell her how she had displeased him because he would not stoop to do so. It was beneath him to explain due to his high birth plus his superior intelligence and education. She was just supposed to know this. Even had you skill, he's saying that even if he was able to say this in words, even had you skill in speech, which I have not, he claims he did not explain to her because he does not have the ability to speak well. Yet, look how well he speaks in this poem. To make your will quite clear to such an one, his sadistic use of force is suggested here. He has contempt for such an one because she is not as highborn as the name he has gifted her. Yeah, you will see the repetition that I said is going to be repeated in this line. Quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss. Or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse. Even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop, oh sir, she smiled, no doubt. Whenever I passed her, but who passed without? Here herself be lessened so, nor plainly said. Again, a sinister, sinister version of taught. His harsh cruelty comes through. He would not have accepted any apologies or excuses from her anyway, had she said sorry, even though he had not explained anything to her. Her wits to yours. He refuses to engage in a demeaning argument with someone of inferior education and intelligence. Some stooping. There's a repetition of stoop. This Repetition of stoop, um, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. He accentuates the coldness and pride that he feels. Break in line. Choose. You'll see there's a break in the line. I choose never to stoop. Emphasis implies his ruthless ego. Whenever I passed her, but who passed without? Much the same smile, this grew, I gave commands. Take note this again is a repetition of what was repeat, was said in the previous slide. Whenever I passed her, but who passed without, much the same smile, this grew, I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below. Then I repeat. But who passed without much the same smile? Cold possessiveness. His possessiveness comes through here. She should not have smiled at anyone except him. And I gave commands 
then all smiles stop together. This is the chilling reali realization that he probably had her killed when he said all smiles stopped together. Will please you rise? He instructs the emissary to get up. This is the messenger. The Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed. This is very dramatic. Only at this point do we realize that the person he is addressing is representing the interests of another young bride. Imagine this, this messenger has come and has been sent by a very rich count as a possible, as providing possibly a new bride for him. And here he's ranting on about his previous duchess. Um, can you think what the messenger thought? We are appalled at the threat to this girl. He hints that the count is so wealthy, generous, that he knows he will get whatever he asks for in the way of a dowry. Sort of snobbery making out that among those super rich, money is of no consequence. He claims that all he wishes for is the girl. However, we do not agree. He seems to be amassed a lot of wealth from his past marriages. And yet, he can't wait for the new dowry that he will be receiving. Just pretense of mine suggests a just, a fair amount for the diary, dowry, sorry, but we know how high he sets his value. So just really means substantial. At starting is my object, object, nay, we'll go. Together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though. Taming a seahorse thought a rarity when Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. In other words, Neptune was cast in bronze for him again, the me. Nay, we'll go together down. The messenger appears to wish to get away. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse. Note the subject is a man forcing his will on another creature. The Duke makes it quite clear that he expects absolute obedience and subservience from his new bride. Klaus of Innsbruck, cast in bronze, points out another treasure by a famous sculptor. Remember the painting on the wall? He actually emphasized who the painter was. Here again, he's emphasizing who the artist is that cast the um, Neptune in bronze. Who was the sculptor? Now we look at the character of the Duke. The Duke is a cold and ruthless snob. He expects his bride to be sufficiently awed by the honor that he has done her in selecting her as his property. The boastfulness of this man contains elements of a psychopath, self-centered and pitiless. There is a hint of the young Duchess's gradual awareness of the insane possessiveness that he has so cunningly rationalized here. We are given insight into the mind of a murderer without a conscience. 
The little Duchess is obviously young, innocent, innocent and artless. Artless, sorry. She has no guile, so she is unable to prevent herself from being pleased by something or showing her pleasure at little things. Her sweetness and charm come through. The messenger merges with the reader particularly, as we are not given a lot to go on. We are both being addressed, him directly and us indirectly. Our awareness tallies with the messengers. Like him, we are fearful and sickened by the revelations here. The drama in this poem, remember we said it's a dramatic mono monologue. One person speaking, but it's dramatic. We are presented with an event set in real space and time. Pereira, 16th century, consisting of dialogue only, the monologue. We experience this event directly as witnesses, not through any commentary or description. The dramatic structure builds up suspense. The moment that the identity of the person being addressed by the Duke is revealed falls straight after the Duke's hint about commanding the death of his previous wife, which forms the climax of the work. We have the measure of this man just in time to be appalled by what he means for the next woman marked by him for a wife. Just for interest's sake, just for a little bit of background, we can look at the two eras, the Renaissance era, uh, era versus the Victorian era. The Renaissance brought about a flourishing of great art, but in seeing an example of such a morally compromised man and his power, the Victorian mind would question how one can reconcile these things with one another. If money comes from ruthless exploitation of others, but gives one the power to make great art, then isn't beauty inevitably tainted? The art. The Duke acquires art as an extension of his power. We can see this by him emphasizing who the artists are. It is a mark of his wealth, importance, that he owns objects of great beauty. His, pr his pride is bound up with this aesthetic. The fact that the Duchess and the artwork representing her seem to merge into one another implies that she is another object in his collection. The calculation of her worth beside his worth is part of the callous nature of this man or even a monster. Her life means nothing beside her wealth. Okay, remember at the beginning I said we're looking at week one of term three. The poem, My Last Duchess. After this, I would like you to go through your notes in your study guide and answer the questions in your study guide. And then you can either mark them yourself or have your facilitator or your mother or your father, whoever, to mark it with you. I believe it gives more value if you mark it yourself and you can see where your mistakes are or where there is a bit more um, information that you can add to your questions. Then at the beginning I also said you have to start with your novel The Fault in Our Stars. It is quite a thick book so you need to read it. I'm going to try and get you going on and get you interested in starting to read the book. The Fault in Our Stars is written by John Michael Green. As an introduction, 
you will see this picture of Esther Earl. Now this novel, Green, dedicated to Esther Earl. Esther Earl met the author John Green at a Harry Potter conference and died of thyroid cancer at the age of 16 in 2010. She is credited with having inspired the character of Hazel in The Fault in Our Stars. Um, those of you who have started reading it will have noted that Hazel is the protagonist, main character of The Fault in Our Stars. Following her death, Earl's parents founded the star, Won't Go Out, a non-profit organization. In other words, let's look at the name of it again. This star won't go out. A non-profit organization that helps families with children who have cancer. When reading the novel, you will note reference to a book, An Imperial Affliction. And this book actually plays quite a big part in this novel. An Imperial Affliction is an imaginary book by the fictional author Peter von Houten. The quote from the book, which plays a key role in The Fault in Our Stars, comes at the very beginning of John Green's novel. This epigraph focuses our attention on two important symbols in the novel, water and time. John Green is also possibly making fun of the habit of putting rather pompous and show-offy epigraphs at the beginning of a novel. The fact that this is an entirely fictitious famous work is a wry joke. It's worth pointing out that Green often represents things in a way that can be both humorous and serious. The title of Van Houten's novel comes from a poem by Emily Dixon. This Dickinson, sorry, this is not fictional. This poem, there's a certain slant of light, 320. There's a certain slant of light. Winter afternoons that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. Heavenly hurt it gives us. We can find no scar but internal difference where the meanings are. None may teach it any. Tis the seal despair. An imperial affliction sent us of the air. When it comes, the landscape listens. Shadows hold their breath. When it goes, tis like the distance on the look of death. Essentially, the poem describes a moment in which one is flooded with an all-encompassing despair. The affliction here can probably be applied to cancer the de disease afflicting the central characters in our novel. Note, an important feature of the literary style of this novel is the use of references to poems and philosophy. Green uses them very effectively to support his themes and extend his message to the reader. Now, I would like you to read chapters one and two before our next session. This will help you understand any discussions about the first two chapters that I might um, discuss. In other words, that I might present. And um, it is very important. If you do not read in advance, you will not understand what I am discussing. If you have any questions, please post them in the question box on the right hand side or below. I will answer them and they will be sent to you. If you do not receive them, please contact info at impact.co.za. If you have <coughs> sorry, if you have any further questions, 
after the session, you can send them to academics at impact.co.za and I will certainly get back to you. It is very important for you to download um, this presentation as you can use it as a guide in your study by um, reading and pausing, etc. Um, the handout is in a PDF form, so you can go through it very at your own time when studying it. If you are unable at the end of the session to download it for some reason or other, it is also, remember, available on um, Optimi's um, YouTube. If you are not registered with Impact, can contact us at info at sorry at info at impact.co.za. I hope you enjoyed the session and that you learned something. I know it was quite a long one and a lot of information, but um, I hope it will assist you with your studies. Thank you and goodbye.